University, and so hopefully you're in the right place. And I have to tell you, one of the great things about being a part of MCN is getting to know uh, people who are doing wonderful, exciting things outside of my normal realm. I work at the LA County Museum of Art, but um, have, a, have a, a deep interest in various cultures, particularly Native American culture, and, but I don't have as much knowledge as I'd like to have. And uh, meeting these three women uh, has been a great thrill to me. They're doing really interesting work. Um, uh, working, they're two artists and a writer who are bringing their uh, unique perspectives to technology and uh, thinking hard and working deeply in co with culturally, culturally situated design tools. I just learned this term from them actually and I, I, I think it's really important. Um, they're trying to create this sort of two-way bridge across the digital divide, uh, doing participatory design and trying to really bring in information from uh, various uh, underserved communities and connect them with um, the high-tech domains. Um, and it's a lot, they're allowing knowledge to move in both directions um, across the digital divide. So it's, it's a great honor, a great honor to be able to kind of organize this panel uh, for this excellent work. Um, so we have three panelists, Sarah Stirch, did I say that right? Sturch. Sturch, excuse me. <laughs> Nobody ever does. Okay. And Anne Cudworth and Natrice Gaskin. And Sarah will be our first panelist. And uh, she's a Washington, D.C. based consultant for cultural and historical organizations and a master's student at George Washington University in Museum Studies. She got her undergraduate degree in Native American Studies with a certificate in Museum Studies from Indiana University, Purdue University the IUPUI, <laughs> I love trying to say that, <laughs> she's a Wikipedian and has been since 2004, and she served as the first Wikipedian in residence of the Smithsonian Institution and continues to serve as an ambassador for GLAM between Wikimedia and cultural organizations. Search is also developing outreach opportunities to help close the gender and cultural gaps within Wikimedia. So it's a great honor to introduce Sarah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can see me up here behind this gigantic <laughs> laptop. Um, can you, assuming you can hear me OK even without a microphone, I'm sure. So, um, so right, so I'm going to be discussing um, just a, sort of a little project that's close to my heart that I'd love to see um, come into fruition someday. So, um, as Diana mentioned, I, I'm a longtime Wikipedian. Um, I, I contribute to Wikipedia. I edit it, I write articles, um, I upload photographs and media content, all for the use of the world and the public to enjoy, and hopefully enjoy and use. Um, so, with this presentation, I'm, I'm interested in exploring opportunities in which indigenous communities, and, and that includes galleries, libraries, archives, museums, glams, you'll hear me use that a lot, today um, can work with the Wikimedia community. Um, Wikimedia uh, consists of a lot of different, um, not just Wikipedia, which everybody knows is a big encyclopedia, but a lot of other different um, open source opportunities um, and projects, which I'll talk a little bit about. So my, my main goal with this um, idea is to see how we can utilize Wikipedia and related projects um, for cultural preservation and to also help close uh, a cultural gap on Wikipedia, which is very big. Over 77% of our editors are white, um, just like um, in many ways, history and culture has often been white, written from an Anglo point of view, and um, I'd like to see that change. 91% of our editors are also male in Wikipedia, and um, it just kind of shows you some of the problems we have in our community. Um, so I'm hoping this might be an interesting way to not only benefit indigenous cultures, specifically um, I'm writing on, or speaking about um, North America, um, but also maybe bring a more diverse um, group of people into our community. Um, and, and I know a lot of people here are from all kinds of different museums and, and cultures, so it's kind of interesting. I'd like you to think about how maybe this can relate to your museum, your own mission, or your own community. Sequoia. So this is our mission at the Wikipedia, uh, or Wikimedia Foundation and in Wikipedia. Imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. That's our commitment. And I have Sequoia here, who um, is Cherokee. We're here in his hometown, so thanks to uh, 
um, the Eastern Cherokee and, and Cherokee folks who are from here for letting us come hang out this week. And uh, Sequoia created the first written language um, for North American peoples. Um, pretty smart guy. So as you can see, our mission is pretty simple. And I'm sure it might even kind of coincide with some of the missions of your own institutions. Um, the work I've done with the Smithsonian, it, it really does align with the Smithsonian's mission. And I think we all kind of want to see this. We want to see knowledge be shared for free with everyone. Um, Wikipedia is the fifth most popular website, sometimes from the seventh. It depends on the day. Um, and my own work, again, I've been editing since 2004. And it wasn't until the past year or so where I became active in working with cultural organizations to partner with Wikipedia to see how we could bring information about your organization to Wikipedia. So if you're interested in, let's say, the Smithsonian, I recently wrapped up work at the Archives of American Art. And I worked with the archives and their staff, their archivist and curator, to help improve content on Wikipedia about American art history. And we crowdsourced hundreds of Wikipedians from all over the world because we already have a solid community. So it doesn't take a lot to crowdsource with Wikipedia. And we improve this content. So what I'd like to see happen is how Wikipedia can work with these indigenous communities, and maybe perhaps specifically their GLAMs, to help improve content related to indigenous cultures. So this is, um, many of you have been on uh, Wikipedia, you, you know what it looks like. Um, this is Cherokee Wikipedia. We have over 250 different language Wikipedias. So this is sort of a really unique way where open source technology is working as a cultural preservation tool. This Wikipedia is edited by Cherokee speakers. Um, yes, uh, you can have Cherokee uh, on, your, on your laptop or computer, um, font-wise and language-wise. And um, it's very cool. Um, there, I'm not sure exactly how many articles there are in it. But yeah, we have a Cherokee Wikipedia, so it's a pretty unique language preservation tool. Um, we have, uh, on English Wikipedia specifically, the most popular one, we have over 5,900 articles which relate to Native American or uh, indigenous communities of North America. The majority of those articles are stubs, which means just a couple sentences. You know, um, Sequoia created the first written language for Native Americans. Maybe that's all it is, you know. Um, so we need a lot of work to be done on these, these articles. Um, a few other, let's see, what other language do we have? We also have Diné, Navajo. It's very colorful, which I love. And um, you can also see some of the blanket pattern that they designed. Now, this was obviously started by people within the Navajo community. Um, I can't read Diné, but I have a few friends who do. And while they don't contribute, they have used it a couple times. Um, I think it's really cool that people have taken initiative to sort of utilize this as a, as a language preservation tool. But one of my concerns is, well, this is really great and awesome, and you know, we have a Diné language Wikipedia. We lack coverage in English Wikipedia, the most popular one, again, about native culture. And um, I, 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 while these are great, they do limit the larger impact that um, English Wikipedia has. So uh, again, like I said, we, need, we have a major need for uh, Native American related content on Wikipedia, and that's ranges from historical content, which is usually more fleshed out. Um, as we know, um, rumor has it indigenous people still don't, don't exist today, according to history books, and we desperately need content related to contemporary culture. And um, uh, whether it's fine art, I write about contemporary artists. Um, that's my area of, of research right now, these days. Um, we don't have a lot of writing about contemporary Native artists. Uh, we don't have a lot of writing about simple things like uh, bird calling. Uh, the article on Wonka Tonkin is horrible. Um, general, uh, no notable people, especially women, absolutely terrible coverage. So how can we start working with these communities, like the Diné speaking people, um, to say, hey, put it on your Wikipedia, but let's bring it to English Wikipedia too. So Wikipedia is a very special place. Um, we have lots of pros and cons to working with us. So I'm gonna take a look at the cons first and try to wrap up on a positive note. So low quality articles, as I mentioned, um, the majority are pretty bad. Um, they're generally written with outdated sources um, and are often written, uh, you know, contemporary indigenous studies and culture has evolved into being kind of a reclaimed um, study. Uh, native people are saying, hey, we need to start looking at how uh, contemporary culture is representing us and start writing about it and exploring it. The majority of the articles that I see generally have outdated resources or resources that were written in the 1950s and 60s by anthropologists 
the things that many of us love to hate who study contemporary native culture. So we desperately have a need for the improvement. One of our issues is oral history. As we know, oral history is a very strong component and part of indigenous culture around the world. And Wikipedia relies on reliable secondary sources. We want our encyclopedia to be just that, a place where you can read about a subject, go to the references, well, source references, preferably, and then go to that link or go to that book and find out what page it's on, a starting point for research. Um, so no, I'm not asking your students to ever cite Wikipedia. Um, neither are we at Wikipedia. Um, so oral history is tough because it's a primary source, and just because your grandmother was the last weaver on earth who, who weaved that specific style doesn't mean you can write an article about her and people are going to want to keep it on Wikipedia. We have to have it be notable, and we have to have it be sourced. And oral history is one of those tricky areas. Um, I have a lot of ideas on how that could change within the community. Um, and one of the, the great things, like the Archives of American Art, um, they document oral history on their website. So we have all these wonderful published oral histories from amazing artists from around the world. Um, and I utilize them because they've been published. And while it's still primary, it's published on the internet. So we need more oral histories published online or in books. Lack of awareness about verbiage and political correctness. Wikipedia is the internet. There's always going to be a special group of people on the internet that don't necessarily know how to behave or speak properly. Or maybe they just think Indians are cool and they write, want to write about cowboys and Indians and cool stuff. Um, I've read articles where people are called Red Man. I have read articles where people are called just Indians, where maybe they don't know that the Navajo prefer to be called Diné, and that's not everybody. Most people don't know that, but some of us do. And if we can work with communities to say, hey, we need guidelines on how people want to be represented. We need scholars who understand how to write about this content publicly and, and work with communities. And this is not just related to indigenous cultures. Um, I think it could be a really powerful tool. Nothing like this exists in the community. Few contemporary images of communities and people. Again, many people believe that indigenous communities don't exist anymore or that people are extinct. Um, Wikipedia is the same. Most of our images are Edward Curtis images. We don't have contemporary photos of the Pomo people. We have photos of them from you know, 1897. Um, people don't know that there's contemporary artists. People don't know that there's contemporary bands making awesome punk rock music in communities. People don't, we don't have videos of powwows and families and people doing creative co contemporary art. Um, it's a struggle, and, and just like the history books show, um, Wikipedia could be one of those places where people are represented. Anyone can edit or use it. A lot of people fear that Wikipedia is going to be abused, that your page will be vandalized, that someone will come along and, and uh, mess it up. It happens very rarely. We have thousands of people who dedicate their online time to cleaning up messes, who literally can go find things and, and have little bots, robots that track um, vandalization of articles. It's so rare that an article of the content on Wikipedia is going to be abused, whether it's on Wikipedia or offline, like in media. Um, it just is really rare. And because Wikipedians really care about the quality and who's utilizing it. Lack of contributions from indigenous people, mainly white males. So as I said, the majority of our contributors are um, white males. Um, oh, look, that's Kevin Costner. There he is in all his glory. Um, yeah, so we have a problem with that. Um, as one of the few female editors in the community, um, I know how it affects articles about women and female subjects, or lack of. Um, so imagine what it's doing for indigenous communities. Um, Wikipedia is one of those places where everyone can have their voice heard, even though it should be neutral. Because again, it's an encyclopedia. We don't want... You know, we're the greatest community on earth, and, and our powwow is the best. But we want to know that that powwow is taking place and that your community is still here on earth. So when you have just a bunch of white guys writing about it, you never know what you're going to get. No offense to the white guys. Because <laughs> I'm a white girl. <laughs> so prose, it's free. Anyone can edit it. Anyone can mess with it. Anyone can use the content on it. And it doesn't cost, it doesn't cost anything. It might take a little investment, like love, time, technology, um, but there's ways to even get that stuff for free these days. And by working with indigenous communities to say, hey, we can get you some computers with grants. Hey, we can teach you how to use this stuff. And you can control what's on it. It's pretty exciting. It's very slow at loading here. You don't have to if you don't want to. I'm not forcing anyone to edit Wikipedia. Um, I'm just throwing out ideas. But again, you know, you don't have to edit if you don't want to edit it. 
So that's exciting. So no one's people. People came up to me, and I, I presented this at um, the Indigenous Peoples and Museums Conference in Indianapolis this um, summer, and folks said, "Well, I don't want to do this. I don't want. You to, are you trying to force me to work with? You know, people just thought it was kind of a, another way of me saying you need to. to I'm going to force you to be involved in our project. So um, like some kind of dominance again. And I said, No, I'm not trying to force anybody to, to edit Wikipedia. I'm just throwing around ideas. And no one has to edit. No one's being forced. It's a skill builder. As a master's student who was a makeup artist for 10 years before returning back to school, writing was not one of my strong suits when I returned to college. And I have to admit, I've probably learned more through Wikipedia in regards to our strict peer review process, um, my grammatical errors, and how to cite sources, and how to utilize these, um, these tools as we, we do in our writing. Um, through Wikipedia, more than I have through school. And don't tell my program that. I'm sure they'd hate to hear that. But it's true. Um, it's a great skill board builder. You learn basic technical skills on coding, very simple coding. Anyone can do it with a little bit of time and dedication. And kids can learn, or adults can learn about citing sources, you know, grammatical work, um, and how to write good, decent, scholarly Wikipedia articles. Preservation, a cultural preservation tool. Wikipedia is one of those places where you can write an article about it, and if it's well cited and sourced, it's going to be there until the internet is gone, which we hope never happens because we all be out of jobs. So it's it's a great cultural preservation tool. People can have their voices heard. Who you know, it's not just about Britney Spears. It's it's also about Jim Denemy, um, who's an amazing uh, artist. He's awesome. This is from the Idle Jordan Museum in Indianapolis, where I was a, a previously worked. And I've written a lot of articles about contemporary Native artists, and Jim is one of them. And it's great exposure, whether it's about your community. And I, we say we don't like it's Wikipedia's not an advertising tool, but you know when when Jim Denemy's article gets you know 1.2 million hits in a year, people are reading about Jim Denemy. And he's told me, Sarah, people are going back to my website and looking at my art. I don't know if he's got the sale out of it, but the fact that more people are aware about the work that he's doing has been really cool. And if they can do it for Jim and a few other artists, Ryan Singers, Navajo, a few other folks, then imagine what it can do for entire communities to let people know we're here and we're doing great things. So partnerships and possibilities. These are just some of the ideas that I have in, in regards to this opportunity or, or project. So how can we work with tribal glams to expand on content related to their collections and culture on Wikipedia? Just like we're doing with the general museum community right now, and I've done the archives, or Lori Phillips, who spoke yesterday at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. How can we work with these cultures to directly um, uh, explore the materials in their collections and, and have better content and coverage about them? Because not only do the people have the knowledge, but you know they're going to have the resources, the books, the documentation, and, and the guidance on where to find those materials to be covered on Wikipedia. Provide a framework for Wikipedians regarding cultural sensitivity. One does not exist, and best practices are needed. And this goes beyond just indigenous communities. Um, how can we improve Wikipedia by teaching Wikipedians to be better writers and Wikipedians and more culturally sensitive? Um, I have this dream of seeing an indigenous peoples and free culture conference take place someplace, somewhere. Um, I think it'd be so cool to have three days of of indigenous folks and anybody else interested from around the world come together and to have open source, free culture communities say, hey, we're, we're an affordable option. We have a hackathon. I mean, more people need to be getting their hands in this technology. It's not just about bragging about what you've done, but teaching people how to do it. And if people are given the tools and a little bit of time, some really cool things could be taking place. Um, outreach. So in um, the Glam Wiki world, uh, the Wikipedia Outreach Project, uh, we are Wikipedians in residence, as we say, like I've been at the Smithsonian. I'd love to see an opportunity to have a Wikipedian on reservation. Um, having some folks uh, go out and say, hey, I'm going to spend two weeks, two months uh, on the res or in your community and, and set up the computers or work with your community center or work with your library and teach local people how to contribute and edit and upload photographs and record cool videos and, um, and then leave and hopefully great things will happen or they can have someone else hopefully local become that Wikipedian on reservation. Um, funding would be nice, you never know, but I think there's some pretty cool opportunities. So I can babble all day about this, but I won't. Um, so those are just some of the ideas on how I think indigenous communities and um, how people in general could be working with them to improve content on um, the most popular educational website in the world. So thanks so much.
And uh, that's my, my Twitter and my email. Feel free to shoot me an email. And if you're on Wikipedia, that's my username. So thank you so much. It was great and inspiring. Um, I think it'll work. Uh, hopefully it's okay with you all to hold our questions till the end and uh, make sure each person gets their, gets their um, presentation uh, completed. And uh, Our second uh, pre presenter is Ann Cudworth, and she is the principal and founder of Alchemy Sims. She's also a seasoned Emmy Award-winning designer. Uh, she's a pro with 15 years of design experience in virtual environments for network television, webcasts, and virtual wor worlds. She combines 12 years design and visualization teaching experience on the college level with a management and design career for network television. Her experience is matched with a solid background in virtual environmental design, fabrication, and technical medical illustration. She holds an MFA in scenic design from NYU and a BFA in medical illustration. I love this background. <laughs> Um, her postgraduate studies at Pratt uh, are in 3D software. She's also received the IBM Exhibition Grant for Inland Search for the Sky, a game-based experience in Second Life. She and her team are widely regarded in Second Life as a premier builder, and she's also an official Second Life solution provider. Um, and, and she has more on LinkedIn, and I'm, she'll give you other information um, along with the presentation. So here's Anne. So I guess my, my background really says is I've never really actually decided what I wanted to do. So I've just tried everything. And uh, I've been very lucky, actually, in my, in my life. I have always uh, sort of managed to get interested in something and then have a work opportunity present itself. So uh, today I want to talk a little bit about uh, what I've been doing for the last three years. Uh, both in Second Life and also in OpenSim, which is now the current offshoot of uh, Virtual Worlds. It's available to everybody. Uh, it, what I do is I build multi-user virtual environments, or MOOCs, as I like to call them, that combine <coughs> art, anthropology, and storytelling to create an entertaining, immersive experience for the visitor. All of these environments are a result of a collaborative effort. I do not do this alone. I have people who write scripts for me, people who help me build. And at the end, I'd like to talk a little bit about how these environments might help your museum grow its audience. So, but first, how we got there. Back in 2008, I built a sim that changed seasons. It was called the Tree uh, Trees. It was the Trees Region, the Sundial Estate. <coughs> and people would come on uh, and start to uh, walk around, and very quickly discovered. Uh, that they could play a game, and we thought that was very interesting, that they would start inventing games over an environment that we, they, we had built. Uh, they'd say, the command was season winter, and anything within 96 meters would change, the water would freeze, the trees would change. We had a lock in the middle of this sim, and they would run out on the ice, and then they would yell, season summer, melt the ice, fall into the water, jump up, run out on the land, and do the whole thing all over again. <laughs> and we thought that this was inspiring. We, we, just, we just had to continue with that. So we started to think of other ways that we could make our environments interactive. Now, none of us were game designers. We were all just people that liked to hang out together and build things. So I said, well, why don't we build a pop-up book for Second Life's sixth birthday? The theme was the alien gardens. Uh, the theme of the whole entire birthday celebration, which is kind of like a giant exhibition, was alien. It was alien planet. So we built this environment. Uh, the beams were uh, to protect you from the alien environment. And the stories that we built, these pop-up books, were about things that interested us in Second Life. And as the story was told in local chat on the screen, it was a text message, basically, the book would produce sound effects and music, and it would pop up objects and tell you the story visually uh, with an auditory track as well as a textual track. 
And then once it was done with its story, it would just fold up and wait for the next person to touch it. The next year, we decided to continue our literary bent, and we built a poetry slam machine. This spoke four different languages, English, French, Spanish, and German, and in four different styles, pirate, vampire, robot, and verbal master. And what you did was you touched the, we, used, we called them refrigerator magnets, you touched the little white buttons up on the top, which had those words. Uh, I'm sorry, you touched the, the panel that was on the bottom, which had the words, and they appeared on the buttons on top. So you created these lines of poetry together. And people would do this as teams and run around on top of it. They loved it. We discovered that virtual worlds can, by just being experienced, provide a basis for the increase in learning and memory in their visitors. And if desired, these virtual worlds can change themselves to respond to the reaction they generate in the visitors. So that the whole environment can become interactive. The memories of the virtual space are the same in your mind as a real space. I find myself constantly, again and again, thinking about a space and then having to remind myself, oh, that's right, that was a virtual place. Then we, did, then we got into another game called The Gods That Walk Among Us. This was a new venture for us. It was, as you can see, based sort of in a mythological aspect. This environment was designed to be access for all so that disabled gamers could participate. I do a lot with virtual ability in Second Life. It had four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. Very, uh, all alchemists hold those four elements dear. Uh, and four riddles and four masks that you could win as a reward. So when people played them, they would then take pictures of themselves with the masks on and send them back to us. So I got a lot of feedback of the pictorial variety, which was a lot of fun. And we decided to branch out. We built an outdoor art park that had interactive and database-driven sculptures. Here's some pictures of a few of them. Uh, the top left is a word cloud that if you walk up and start typing in local chat, these boxes would hear their own word and they would start to expand. And then in the middle on the top is a, a uh, representation of the, my concept of how a tree would store the memories of its days. And it would peel, the layers would peel away and peel away from the inside of the tree and you would see how it stored the layers of its days and its memory. And it would get you thinking about dendrochronology or the history of trees these chairs were studying scale as they, were, they went from very, very tiny to very huge and how we relate to things like that. And then down on the bottom is a database related uh, uh, tidal database. Move the arms on that, uh, on those sculptures. Uh, and then the rest were sort of uh, physical interact. They would interact with you as you came close to them. Your avatar came close to them physically. We restricted flying on that sim so that people had to walk around and see that. Through sight and sound, you can experience a piece of sculpture that is also telling you about tidal rhythms, or you can learn about anthropology as we play a game, looking for the clues to the social structures of a fictitious culture. And this brings us to the first case. I want to talk about particles of alchemy. This was the first full-blown environment that we built that actually had a game aspect to it that we intended to have. Uh, we created a virtual environment that fostered the three Cs, connection, communication, and collaboration. And as I said, it was all fictitious. We introduced this culture to a visitor in three ways. We gave them a note card that described the history of the alchemists on the sim. Alchemy was a big thing, it still is. Uh, we gave them the opportunity to take a tour vehicle, which would play back snippets of the conversations that the radio had heard. So you would oversee conversations in text as to what people were describing that happened in the past in this tour vehicle. And then we also created a progression of architectural artifacts that would sort of tell the story of what happened on this sim. And now I'm going to tell you the story. The note card said this when you arrived. Almost beyond the reach of our memories, some intrepid souls found a new shore in our world. They called themselves alchemists, a name both strange and wonderful on our ears. They came in wondrous ships made of bronze and gold with red sails as bright as the sun and when they landed, they spoke a strange tongue that sounded like the whisper of drums on our ears. They thrived on our eastern shore. They traded their gold in a strange element called phylogiston, which they revered. They taught us to honor the four elementals, the air, the fire, the water, and the earth, and we saw a truth fundamental. They lived among us, worked with us, married us, and yet we never really knew them. They had a distance in their gleaming eyes, often behind the merry laugh, a certain sad secret. We moved through the centuries with them, from the ancient times of stone and stick 
to the times of machines built to measure the wonders around us. We listen through their earthquake scope to the heart of our volcano in a house made of water. We stood in awe of their volcano engine made to harness our fiery lands with its great bellows and pipes that glowed with the heat of the Earth's core. We watched as they collected the power of the lightning and made it serve our needs. So great was the mass of the earthquake ball that we housed it in the stone cradle. We will remember the welder's torches seen night and day from the age of our grandfathers into the futures of their children. It was a beautiful and fragile place. Then one day the ground trembled, not with the shrugs of an indifferent volcano, but with the thrusts of massive engines, huge rockets lifting the alchemists into the skies. Our loss cannot be measured by a widow's tears or the cries of their children, but in the science, silence of their empty workrooms and the slowing of their machines. We have found only small clues about their secrets. They hid their treasures, secret rooms in our land, opening only with the correct keys. We seek the artifacts that they left behind, one for each elemental station, and hope that this will lead us to the keys that will unlock the secrets of our survival. Help us, kind strangers, in our quest for survival and the secret gifts they hid from us. And as you can see, the sim is in bad shape. That was how we started out. About four months later, we decided we were going to take the sim down, so we started the demolition process, and the tale grew with the telling. The volcano engine started to break down. And the power started to fail. Everything started to fall apart, and the natives became desperate to survive. Resources for rescue were limited. Their neighbors, uh, the neighbors managed to come and help rescue some of our sea life. That's the watcher being lifted by the helicopter. Then at the edge of disaster, a great event occurred. Four pillars and beacons appeared to notify the native population of a new arrival to their world. You can see the weather's pretty bad. The alchemists had come back in a great golden ship to rescue the natives who had been so welcoming to them, and they all departed to the stars and a new world to share in an unending partnership. And here is the alchemist ship. These remarkable environments are a portal through which information of all kinds can be experienced in many ways. This is case two, inland search for the Psy. And interestingly enough, Psy on, I made on some sort of uh, subconscious level relates to she, who are the fairy folk. That's the name of the fairy folk in, uh, in Ireland predominantly. And I didn't realize I was sort of working with fairy folk, but I actually was. This uh, sim was about an indigenous population that actually lives within your computer, the Psy. And we, because we started building virtual worlds within our computer, we started to bump up against their world. And our scientists there disappeared. Three scientists have disappeared, and your job is to try to find them. I spoke with Dr. K, Dr. Louise Krasnowitz, over at the uh, University of Pennsylvania about what cultural anthropologists actually do, because I was creating a character by the name of Aubrey Wynn, Dr. Aubrey Wynn. She is a cultural anthropologist, and she is in search of her missing colleagues who have been spirited away by the side. So we had to work on a backstory. What's going on on this sim? It's a virtual Earth. There's de-evolution going on. We've gone back to the Precambrian phase, the rise of the diatomato or the diatoms, because the psi are silicon-based. The diatoms are our only silicon-based life form, so there was some sort of a connection starting. And there was an empty station based on Grand Central, faded elegance overgrown by Precambrian vegetation, which we did our research for, took a look at what we could build out of that, and we started to create a scientific journal. This is her journal. We also created content parts for our characters, the Psy, and the world they lived in. And we did an awful lot of off-site building before we got ready to actually install it on the sim that IBM gave us the grant to use. Then we play tested it for a couple of weeks to make sure people could actually play the game. And what was the game? Like all stories, it's an experience that can be contained in a book. So the first thing you find is Dr. Wynn's journal, which is on the steps of the station. This sets you off on a process to find some parts which will allow you to create a tool which will allow you to access the next level, which is called transit. There it is, the more, another shot of the first level. Parts of the tools are everywhere. They're hidden all over, all over the sim. 
We also gave them a list of instructions. There were many instruction cards that they got at various levels. They showed them a diagram of how to put together the crystal oscillator. And once you found that and got to the mesh anomaly, you could then get to transit. Transit was a world the Psi built for us in order for us to understand their world and allow us to transfer into a Psi-based life form so we could actually visit their world. Psi world was made totally from fractals. Once you became a Psi, you solved another riddle, and then you could visit Psi space, which was totally fractalized, all the men's your sponge. Here you could claim a trophy, and you could get your name put up on the finders of the Psi board. This was a, a way that we allowed people to uh, access and also to get name recognition. We put this honors board up on the wall. And now the data. I recorded data from day one on this to see who was coming and how, how often they were coming. We had 3,116 3, visits in 90 days, uh, 1,800 unique visitors and over, <coughs> 500, over 500 returning visitors with an average visit time of 19 minutes, which is a century and second worth time. Um, we can see there was a spike when we were listed in the destination guide, but it settled into a fairly regular visitation pattern. They visited the longest on the weekends, but we had the most visitors during the weekday, sort of like network television. Thursdays was kind of like the night everybody decided to go visit Second Life. Now I'm going to move on to my third uh, project. This is in development right now. It's a project called Four Points. It's inspired by the convergence of scientific discovery coming from the Los Alamos National Labs and the Santa Fe Institute with the native, ancient Native American archaeological and cultural history in the area around, around there, specifically Bandelier National Park. While exploring this environment, each player will seek to meet four non-character players. And these are can be anything from chatbots to uh, actually sort of interactive avatars. Uh, the coyote, the storyteller, the elemental, and the alchemist. And the gameplay will teach global fan game fans about theories involving bioacoustics, complexity and chaos, and Native American mythology. It's sort of science theory, mythology, storytelling, and totem creation game, where Mist meets a graphic novel meets a science lab. Mm. The questions I'm asking as I develop this is how does our current scientific theory relate to mythology? And here is a, here is a very early version of what the, what the land may look like as it related to the Bandelier National Park area. How can we engage a scientist or an artist to expand their thinking? In this environment, the non-player characters who interact with the players, as avatars, will provide information and sometimes misinformation as the players explore the paths of the environmental experience. These are some early pictures. Uh, you guys are the first to see these. Uh, these are some early pictures of the characters. These will probably change quite a bit. As you can see, the coyote is human. Uh, and as they relate to the player and the interactions of. And I ask myself, what is the spirit of the space that I'm creating? This is one of the spaces we'll be creating. Some general observations about moves and why they could be a good thing for museums. It, you can build a community in a compelling place. Essentially, a virtual world space is a social space just as a museum is. And because of this, virtual spaces can become powerful community building tools for museums, not only attracting locals, but the people worldwide. You can extend the experience. It can extend the museum going experience well past the real space it visit and introduce it well in advance of the actual show. You can crowd test and prototype your exhibit. Your costs are relative in this age of crowdsourcing and goods exchange, and given the basic tools provided by most client browsers, it's entirely possible that the online community of a museum could build it themselves. Hosting and virtual <coughs> land have become quite cheap, so real commodities are actually conceptualization, leadership, and stewardship. A well-designed move indicate, includes visual cohesiveness and consistency. A sound landscape is very important. Clear directional guides in all major languages and audience participation. Remember, design for all. Reinforce the visual with sound. Back up the sound with visual. And if possible, provide human-based avatar guides. Make it easy, but uh, don't make it easy, but make it accessible. And then I sort of like to sum this all up in one diagram here, which kind of, for me, represents an optimum experience. Your sim environment sets up scenarios and poses quest questions or sets, you know, sets an interest going. What's your message? 
What's your data over overlay? What aspects of some elements allow for discovery of answers and information? Is fun being experienced very important? Are skills being taught? Now this is varies from skills in terms of learning new things, learning new, new concepts, or learning how to build something. And then the guiding story of the gatekeeper for discovery on the quest allows the visitor to experience flow for optimal information absorption and to build knowledge. And that's the optimum visitor experience in my opinion. And that's the end of my presentation. computers and um, while we do that should I take a question you, you'll be quick mm -hmm. okay thank you. this is Natrice Gaskins Natrice is a doctoral candidate and researcher at Georgia Tech's experimental games lab EGL her work investigates culturally situated design as it relates to youth and urban subcultures <coughs> and blended realities <coughs> she is also an artist educator and youth art media specialist who sits on the board of the National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture, NAMAC. <laughs> Latrice is the author of The Shifting Aura of Contemporary Art, The Paradoxical Art of Inception, both in 2010, The Artist is Prescient, Relational Aesthetics and Augmented Reality, in 2011 for Art 21, and Cybism and Decoding the Letter, Building Afro-Futurist Style Game Layers, on Top of the World at ISEA Istanbul in 2011. So we introduce Natrice as she gets all the way set up. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> so um, this is what I'm um, talking about cultivate, cultivating diverse participation through digital media and exploring new media forms and formats that can sort of transform the museum going experience and engage diverse audiences. Um, who are active users of mobile phones, gaming devices, and other emerging technologies. Um, this is kind of what I'm basing some of my discussion on, and that's the cognitive computer artifact. So it's defined as an artificial device used to maintain, display, or operate within, uh, upon information in order to serve a representational function. So this is here at um, the conference. This is um, one of our game, ARG game. Um, team members actually wearing the, um, one of the QR codes for the game um, as on her iPad on her person. And then this is a, a, a school I'm working with in Gainesville, Georgia, who we're doing a ninth grade world history augmented reality experience. So this is um, sort of how I kind of explain how this all comes around the artifact that mediates directly between the person and the object. Um, they can also, these artifacts can present a virtual or um, object or world upon which operations are performed, eventually reflected into real objects. So some, the layers or the examples of this would be the representation itself um, and the, rep the represented world of the real object and the representing world within the artifact and the way the artifact displays the virtual world. And then the mental or symbolic gestural or performative representation of the human. And um, I'm going to show some examples of these, um, each one of these things um, here. But first, I want to talk about for this audience um, and then how this merges. So these are um, from cabinets of curiosities um, then and now. So museums evolved from exhibitions referred to as cabinets of curiosities or cabinets of wonder. These ex exhibits were closed to the public and really only accessible by wealthier, more privileged, privileged members of society. So this year in London, the last Tuesday Society attempted to recreate um, or create a sense of wonder by turning a storefront cabinet of wonder into a site of experimentation or play using technologies to, um, that provide new ways to experience what is on display. So um, Maxence is the uh, art, the group that created this. And they were, um, so in this case, uh, Maxence is the person who is wearing a suit composed of a helmet with high definition video glasses and our Duino um, glove and force sensors controlling the 3D view and harness um, for Connect. So instead of having a static point of view, the user becomes able to navigate through the three-dimensional environment, um, enabling new behaviors specific to the hyper-real world while ha still having to physically interact with the real environment. 
Thus, it creates a new um, type of computer interface between these two states. And um, you can actually find these. Uh, this will link to it, so if there's some time, I'll show you. But there's a, a video clip of um, one of the testing out. This, it's a port -a pack with a connect um, and actually walking through a museum um, where the site is now. You can't actually see you're seeing through the device, through the helmet, and, t and, and the museum environment. So the representation, this is another project that kind of got me really interested in um, augmented reality, blending realities. And this is Next Wall's Tagged in Motion um, in terms of it synchronizes gestural movement with an augmented layer of uh, laser graffiti tags in physical space. So here you see the merge, it merges the laser representation and a mixed or blended reality experience. And um, it overlays virtual information in the physical or augmented space to create new opportunities for engagement and participation. Much of this development is coming from the spirit of open innovation and collaboration. So equipped with a handheld augmented reality tool, artist um, Dane uh, sprays virtual graffiti in an empty space. Three motion capture cameras record its position and the movements he executes with a virtual spray can. The resulting data is shown to him in real life in a pair of video glasses as a free-floating three-dimensional graffiti in real space. So he's not actually painting anything, he's just... Well, he is painting, but you, and, and this is what you see. So the entire space becomes the canvas. So these are, some, these are um, so a few other examples of um, what I mean by um, merging these representations. So um, one of them is iWriter, which is down here, and that is an ongoing collaborative research effort to empower people who are suffering from ALS with creative technologies. It was initially designed for graffiti artist Tim One, who can only move his eyes. And um, because of this tool, he's able to exhibit his work. This was exhibited at the Pasadena Museum of um, California Art um, this year, not too long ago. And um, at the top, we have History Pen, which enables people across generations, cultures, and places to share small glimpses of the past and to build up a huge history of human history, um, whose story of human history. So you can use your mobile devices and they're overlaying archival photos onto where their actual locations were in time and space. And um, I don't see him here, but um, John Voss is here from History Pen, so if you want to grab him, you can do that. He's in the culture hat um, area downstairs, upstairs. And um, this is um, Qualcomm's STK software development kit for augmented reality. It's free. And you can actually see how they're actually, this is two-dimensional images. And when you point your um, iPad or mobile device, the, the artifact comes, emerges from the image. What is it called? This is the Qualcomm as a company and offers an augmented reality software development kit, or SDK. And I'm using um, some parts of this for my ninth grade world history class, um, which I'll talk about. So, um, and because uh, what I mean, like, in order to generate these kind of projects, you kind of know all the pieces that have to happen and why they need to happen. So I'll, it'll, it'll, I'll build up to that in a couple of slides. So in this case, the computer interface itself is what is the way in which people can generate these representations of their world. And more specifically, this is kind of highlights the virtual or computer-based artifact as overlays that are also both in the virtual world and in real space. And so there's some technologies that are being, um, HTML5 being one of them. You can add a canvas element, for example, into an augmented reality browser. And here is me on Georgia Tech's campus drawing that tree live with the tree so I can actually see the tree. And then I'm scribbling next to the tree as people walk past. So, the, so that mediates between what I'm doing um, just sitting on a bench and also what's happening in the real world as well. And um, a little bit about HTML5, the element, um, it uses JavaScript to draw graphics on a web page. The Canvas element has several methods. You can draw boxes, circles, characters, add images. The code is, um, it sort of access the Canvas area through drawing functions similar to those of other common 2D APIs, thus allowing for dynamically generated graphics. And then obviously display, so there's different ways you can display, both on your device itself as well as on this case on buildings. So Temp 1, an eye writer, he can actually be in his hospital room and uh, moving his eyes and actually see this displayed on the building through a projection. So he's seeing both as he's working as well as what's happening. In the, and this is uh, the, you know, in Los Angeles on the side of a building, so he can actually see his work as he's working um, being displayed elsewhere. 
So museums can actually use these ideas of blending realities of existing common open platforms to develop software that's situated in these environments to cultivate participation and engagement among visitors from diverse social and economic contexts. Community of practice. So this is the, um, the idea of um, what I was trying to do with and what, I, what we are doing here, they're actually using mobile devices to understand how augmented reality works. So these are a series of markers or one type of augmented reality where um, when they, each one is different. So one is a sneaker that pops up. They can change the colors on it on, their, um, I, on the um, mobile device uh, of the sneaker that's not really real. It's virtual. So the, the marker generates the sneaker. Then they can interact with it on their device. There's another one that generates when they hear when they hear sound will generate an animation of three-dimensional shapes and objects to create a sculpture, which they can also change colors, change the, the types of shapes and things like that. All of this stuff is free. Um, free for these markers are free for printing, and the software is free for download. Are you going to this? I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of the things that we did with the ninth graders is we, we talked about what augmented reality was and then we gave them all the different options um, and the ones we actually could do in a semester um, in terms of December when, they're, when their projects and our projects are due. So it's a very participatory process because we all decided on um, pattern-based or pattern-based AR this way because then they decided they would paint a mural and embed some of this technology in the mural and create an interactive mural based on content that the ninth graders uh, part of the research for world history. Um, what kind of got me started working with that ninth grade class in that school and then eventually the school, Hall County Public Schools, is working in these culturally situated design practices where the design team, for example, has access to tools like Argon and some of the things I talked about before. And then these culturally situated design tools or CSDTs which are coming out of RPI, these web apps that allow students to utilize specific <laughs> mathematical and computational ideas to stimulate the corresponding artifacts, so real artifacts in the virtual space using the math and sort of standards, um, learning standards that for math in this case. So here's the real picture, and then they can create it using this information here. So when I talked to Ron English, who's known on he has a TED talk on African fractals, we were talking about it would be great to have culture his CSCTs. Um, on the spot. So they could actually go out in the real world instead of have, working with a photo that comes from anywhere, be in their environment and actually use this on their mobile devices using the technologies that we're experimenting with now. So this is in process with that school. And this is building up to that. So by taking this body of work to a new level, we develop techniques to help um, these students generate creative interactive designs, transfer these designs to murals, and enhance the murals with augmented reality, thus allowing the digital media to be, or the information to be overlaid when viewed through a touch screen, camera-enabled devices, and so developing these techniques move between virtual and physical um, cultural-based creative designs uh, for learning. It's a bridge to culture rather than a barrier. Um, this is especially important framework for engaging underrepresented um, young people and students. So this is my, this came from my summer research. This is the pipeline for development um, that I, so at the bottom you have your targeted engagement, which of course could be your participatory design, but it goes from idea generation to user experience, and these are kind of different pockets of things that are available. So on one side, you have the platform itself. So the augmented reality platforms, there are a few of them. There are actually more than one. So Argon is one of them. There's Layar, Janeo, and so on. So you can see that you need your platform to develop first. And then at that point, you decide whether it's going to be a proprietary platform or an open platform. So we are obviously using an open platform that's um, sort, of, sort of in between, actually, but it's free. So it's something we can um, get access to and, and break and mess around with. Um, and then in the center is the software development kit. And how that works is you kind of choose the features that work for your particular user experience. So we said, what does it make sense to use if we wanted to create an AR experience with a ninth grade world history mural of ancient Rome or the Mayan civilization? And um, we were using frame markers and then image targets as a part of the Qualcomm SDK. And we just pull that in from, and use that inside of a, think of it in terms of containers, put it in a container um, and work with it that way and, and, and play around with that idea. 
So the train, so there's training for that, capabilities and testing at that level, and then deci deciding what features you want to have for your application, and then of course, at the application stage, putting it all together, and then looking at some of the issues around how you would um, sort of disseminate it and how it um, will be used. Now, of course, it could go back to the, to the um, testing part because obviously when it gets here, if it doesn't work correctly, it has to kind of go back. So this is almost a loop. Um, it can be a loop. And then you get to the user experience itself when they're actually using the device or doing the actual um, product, project in this case. Uh, so I just wanted to so show this, that's kind of how it would happen for a mobile augmented reality experience, but also for some other software design types of things that need to happen in a participatory way. And then across the board is targeted engagement. We go, we you know, work on this part, all the people work on their part, we come together, we decide, um, make some decisions and um, proceed um, a few times you know, in a period of time. So this is one of the things that came out of the ninth grade world history project. There is a medall uh, Mayan medallion, and this has one of Qualcomm's frame markers embedded in it, and it actually works now. So if you were to point, if you had the um, platform and you were to point, you know, argon at this, it would generate an image that the ninth graders created. Um, and it can be an image, it can be a web page, it can be an object, a, a three-dimensional object. The kids were working in Google SketchUp. Um, of my um, ball courts, for example, and um, that would emerge from this medallion. Um, it could be anything that they do as a separate layer on top, including video and audio. So this is a really just a marker that generates, just like the QR code actually, um, but a different type of QR code where the, you really have the content in the middle and it's really just this that you um, have that would generate the augmented reality content. So we're using these frame markers and image targets from the Qualcomm SDK. We're also using panoramas, so the idea of stitching images together either in real space, and I've also done in Second Life, bringing it into Argon as a three-dimensional world inside of your device. Um, and then, of course, you can add content on top of that as well. Um, and then the use of this, um, all these things are sort of being explored as a way to create an experience that matches what um, needs to happen for a ninth grade world history class, but it could be anything. And so I wanted to really just show how that would um, come up. So this is working. If I were to point my device at this, something would come out. Um, and uh, the idea is to, to do that in mural, in this case, and bridging two environments and together. People are in these spaces and it's social and so on. So here's some information. And History Pin's there. Um, John Voss is here from History Pin, down probably the, um, upstairs. The iWriter Initiative, um, CSPTs. There's Argon's new page, and then the Qualcomm, it's a little long, so you can just type that in Google. Um, I'm going to put this on the uh, slide share so that people can um, um, access it. But that's my presentation. Uh, this is fantastic. And we'll try to post, um, we'll try to post these uh, links to the slide shares and hopefully presentations from each of you um, somewhere on the MCN website. We'll figure out where. <laughs> So, um, yes, go ahead and ask questions. Um, yes, I just want to know, is there a way where we could actually see, I mean, not just to go to the website and see the write-up, but actually see something, the, the entire thing? Experience, kind of experiences? Yeah. I mean, is there, there are, once we have, we can see them, um, download them to your mobile device and actually do them. Okay. The ninth grade projects for the, you know, once we're, yeah, yeah. we're in process, but, but, but right. Can, I, the, we go to the website, we can yes. download whatever. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to hang out after that. Uh, we're doing a workshop also as part of the Zach Camp. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. today. Oh, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, other questions? This is such an inspiring uh, and fantastic presentation. Each person gave us a wealth of information and ideas, so uh, you may be kind of uh, processing everything, but um, other questions? <laughs> well, I just wanted to say, I, I think it's interesting, when, when I was coming into this panel, found out this was the panel I was on, I was like, how is this, we had all spoke together on the phone, and we were all kind of talking about what we were doing, and, and I remember sort of just going, I have no idea 
how this is all going to, like, how this all coincides together in a way. For some reason, it was really hard for me to wrap my head around, but not what they were doing, and but just how all of our projects could relate until the end of our discussion. I said, well, I guess it's all about community in the end and how communities work with technology to, to um, close a, a cultural gap, as I, I talked about earlier, um, or a, a form as a, work as a bridge for culture, mm -hmm. you know, not just providing the people who can afford the technology, but, but how can we, we give this technology to a broader audience um, to enjoy and use. And, you know, while Anne was presenting, I thought, well, gosh, imagine this at the beginning of the presentation. I said, well, imagine if we work with indigenous communities to tell these stories from oral history in Second Life. Mm -hmm. And then there she is, she shows the video, or shows the clip, and I was like, oh, man, there it is. And then I think, well, imagine if we could do this with, Wikipedia is not as sexy as these other things, you know? So I was like, oh man, I'm all black and white and boring. <laughs> How do I use Second Life and QR codes to edit Wikipedia? What? You know, it, but it, I think it's really cool to think about how, in a way, all three of these devices or tools and technologies could be used to work with for all types of communities to, to kind of explore um, representation and, and voices, getting more voices heard. And I don't there, know if that makes sense. There are two types of, of diversity I just wanted to point out. There's diversity of people and there's diversity of tools. And these are, you know, so I just wanted to, to put that out there in terms of that. Yeah. I, and I, I, I was wondering if you've ever been approached to like create a, a virtual museum in Second Life or another, you know, similar project. Uh, I, no, I've not actually been asked to build a vir virtual museum. Uh, however, I have been to several. And uh, I have a lot of opinions on what I think a good virtual museum design is, which I'll be happy to share with you uh, uh, outside of the conference. But uh, there are. Uh, Go ahead share, share. <laughs> uh, Because I think I think your last slide where you talked about the six elements of good design, we could really really learn from. Maybe we could be at the, at the at the Sims bar later on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, you're feel free to, to uh, ping me if you're in Second Life. I'm Annabelle Fanshaw in Second Life. Uh, uh, well, there's a couple of, of things that, that would be uh, museum designers who want to do a virtual design should remember. Uh, uh, there, there are some limitations in terms of uh, what you actually can see, because, uh, and there are also limitations in terms of what people can do depending on their experience with the client browser. Uh, new time uh, or first time users often find it difficult to get their camera actually pointed at what they're supposed to be looking at and that's uh, something you should take into consideration make it easy for them to actually see what you want them to see um, one of the ways you can do that is put them on a tour because then it, then it gets locked into the vehicle that they're in and just follows them unless they decide to, to change it but often, often they just let it stay where it is uh, another way uh, another thing that I've done is there's a very very good museum uh, it's an Italian uh, build actually. Uh, it's a pop art museum. Um, because of the limitations on the servers and, and what you know what you can actually represent in three dimensions within a given amount of space and, and have it uh, run smoothly and quickly, um, pop art is a good choice because you can a lot of it is 2D. Um, and there are some sculptures there as well. But one of the one of the smartest things these people did was instead of wasting uh, server server uh, resources by building staircases, they simply just made a hole in the floor and you fell down to the next level. You just walk and drop <laughs> the hole and you're on the next level and you walk over and walk around and then there's another hole in the and you fall. It's not far enough for it, for it to kill your avatar. It just gets you to the next level and it's dead easy. It works every time. Nobody has any trouble with trying to get their camera around the stairs. Uh, so that was another, you know, it's little brilliant things that people discover that I've been sort of collecting as I go out and look at all of the, of the various museums. And that probably helps the flow, too, right? That was one of the points you made. I, I, I also question the, the validity of making something that looks exactly like your facility in real life. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, I mean, unless you've got some sort of, like, spectacular uh, shape, like the, the uh, one in the um, Gary yeah. Museum in Bilbao, or the, uh, uh, or, um, you know, anyway, is it <laughs> You know, uh, you really, I think you're 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 better off to sort of be reminiscent of it, but then find find its own, have it find its own uh, uh, architecture. And, uh, and so, it's a, and also building things in, in uh, if you build things in a skilling, they just go your cameras bumping into the top of door frames, and you just have to go higher and wider all the time. Um, so I'm sort of rambling. I'm sorry. I hope I've helped. I have. That's very helpful. I have a question related to that. So. You know, um, Google, uh, Google 
art project. Yes, thank you. Um, water, 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 water. Um, so they have all these images. You know, you can go to the Met and see their images and blah blah. So it, are you able to? Um, yes. Is there a limitation? <laughs> Every question I ask her, she's like, "We can do it." <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> I tried Second Life once and I flew around in the air naked for 20 minutes. It was really scary. <laughs> that crazy. Really we need a workshop on just how to deal with that. Um, but can you bring it, it, it <laughs> these images? You know, is it, that was the worst thing you to say know, ever on the panel. <laughs> no, that was right. the best. Right. 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 people relate to their avatars it, immediately. It looked, well, I'm not going to get into this. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so can you bring like a public domain images? Is there a limitation in regards to the kind of images, fair use, public domain artwork into? So if you want to exhibit your, you know, collection of 17th century French blah blah paintings, you know, can you bring those into? Yeah, you can. You can. You, 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 yes, you can import any image you want. It, the question starts to become uh, dicey when you try to sell it. Uh, well, there, there are still rights in the Yeah, 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 yeah but they won't. They might stop you, but they won't come over and say, "Don't get it started on." Yeah, public domain and copyright. Right, right. But the, those are definitely issues. But 17th century helps because it's so old. But it depends on who yeah, owns copyright. Yes. Um, for Natrice, when you're working with the kids using their the mobile devices that they already own, mm -hmm. and they're all different, and mm -hmm. you're choosing your SDK that you're going to work with, how are you kind of navigating that to make sure that's going to work on the majority of the kids' phones that they feel included? I found that for this particular group of students. Um, they one it's, that's the other issue. Look, they're an unusual high school mm -hmm. program, but because most kids. don't yeah. allow them to have mobile devices mm -hmm. on them when they're in the space. Mm -hmm. They're allowed, at least in that um, particular class. I'm not sure if in their classes, other classes, most of them seem to have iPhones, and some of them had iPads. Mm -hmm. And so, and I was this is a public school. It's not a you know, and they're bust in. Um, but it seemed as if they had access to, enough of them had access to the, the devices they were able to just download an app. Most of the stuff I, I demoed was cross-platform. So they could use, you know, most of the this. But then, you know, so Oregon developers are working on Android, and we started talking about Windows Phone. You know, so we started talking about that. And, that's an, and then that's a challenge. As it's, it's who's, your, who's your target audience? What's, what are they most likely to have? And they're all going to have some sort of mobile device. Are they smartphones? Are they right. smart devices? Do they have cameras? If they don't have cameras, they can't do an AR at all. Um, you have to have QR code, same thing. You know, if you have, whatever it would take for you to read this right. is what you would need to do that. You know, so that's the. And you just happen to be working with a school that pretty much already has a camera, so you didn't have to provide it. Exactly. So it's easy to prototype. It's easy to do that, and then on the other end, on the back end, develop something that's going to be cross-platform eventually. You know, I find that um, in the U.S., it's most people are, are moving away from Blackberries, but in Jamaica, Blackberry is where it's at sure. right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you know, I'm thinking, okay, I can't bring some of these things, you know, carry them back to Jamaica, but um, are we looking at global? I mean, are we just doing? The U.S. And, and Canada, or or even Europe. What about the global? Uh, I've been here for one year and a half, studying the U.S. Mm -hmm. in the digital media program at the University here in Atlanta. I have the impression that for the most part, yes, most of the work that you see is so heavily based on the idea of the developed world, mostly yeah. U.S. and perhaps Canada and Europe. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, augmented reality has been around for. Years, but mobile augmented reality has only been around for three. Yeah. And it came from the military, and then, you know, it's only been around for three years. So this stuff has only just gotten, it's a very nascent technology, but it comes, to, it's because it's being driven by the smartphone usage. Mm -hmm. The more people have smartphones, the more they're going to be able to do this stuff like this. So it's really that, at least in, in terms of the United States, the smartphone usage keeps growing. So people are able to predict that AR in two to three years is going to be something that's going to be in the United States a big deal, um, and some and other developed uh, places as well. So can you talk a little bit about the digital media PhD program that you're in mm -hmm. and how it serves practitioners? Yeah, um, uh, it's a pro it's so you can do a little bit of practice and you can do a little bit of research or you can kind of be heavily researched. Mm -hmm. But it's a I like the practice. Mm -hmm. Part of it, I like that I can develop an app 
or work with a school to develop an app for a ninth grade world history group mm -hmm. or work with a you know another a community of practice to do some sort of something else mm -hmm. and then that be part of my you know research mm -hmm. um, what I've been able to do is create this very broad um, so I can come at it from cognitive science I can come mm -hmm. at it from you know from on the ground working with you know youth in a particular area or with people in, the, in sub, different subcultures and it still fit in with the kinds of technology the kinds of things I'm researching so it's a it's a it's good to have that kind of both, mm -hmm. um, and that's what it kind of does. It, it you know the emergent play that comes out of um, some of these things um, allow for um, a way to link to a community outside of the Georgia Tech community and more into you know the broader world itself. Yeah, and how old is the program? I would say probably six years, seven, eight years. And are you producing professors or practitioners? I would say a little bit of both. So where do your practitioners go? What kind of work do they end up doing? A lot of them go into game companies. Um, Some others go to design firms. Mm, design firms, yeah. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Are you? Thanks. Oh, we're, we're, he's a graduate and uh, we're, we're yeah, in the I same program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I have a Wikipedia question. I should have made a comment um, early on when you went to a conference and you were trying to kind of evangelize getting people to use this. And they're like, well, why you know, don't force us to use this? And to me, the, the question is, once you build a tool, you clearly identify that we need more diverse voice in there. And what are the strategies for, for outreach? You know, and how, what are the limitations of your tool or your user interface, potentially, in terms of getting people to adopt that? Well, I, mean, I can just go on. I'm like all of us. We can talk about sure, this. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm writing. You know, I've vast uh, documentation on Wikipedia um, that I've written about this kind of material. So, uh, all of, uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now, at least for the foundation, um, uh, is around gender gap, specifically, obviously, with women. So, um, and and people say, oh, you know, women don't have time. Women think it's hard. You know, people like to generalize, but people also, there are legitimate concerns in regards to the interface. It's not that women don't understand how to code. It's that it's, I mean, Wikipedia is, is a certain type of markup where people aren't going to want to sit around and learn it, most people. And most people in this room probably don't edit Wikipedia. I'm sure none of you do, I don't know. But, you know, we're working on a, a visual editor, uh, like a what you see is what you get. Like, um, how many people here maybe have a Word, WordPress blog? Okay, you all do WordPress, but how many people here edit Wikipedia? Okay, two people, but uh, three. Yay! Yeah. So, and um, <laughs> um, that's great. I mean, it's, it's WordPress is a million times easier. Yeah. Than so we're working. We are in the process of, of developing a virtual editor, which will make it sexier and easier to contribute. And it's yeah. not just for women. It's when you. <laughs> and that's what people go. Women are stupid. Why are you just trying to? We're not focusing just on virtual editors just for the poor ladies who can't figure it out. <laughs> it's for my parents. It's for you know, who just want to make a grammatical and you know it's for for people around the world to be able to to feel more comfortable using it. Um, and that's one example, I guess you could say. And uh, when, when, sorry, when we we that uh, uh, okay, in the next few months? <laughs> We've been doing some testing with it. Um, yeah. There's, there's also other, uh, a project that I'm, I'm starting to develop um, the next six months is sort of having a welcome community, uh, a more um, uh, an environment where people who are new to editing can come and kind of hang out and talk to friendly customer servicey. Like I'm a pretty good outreach person. I like to talk about it. I like to uh, go out and preach the gospel of how awesome Wikipedia is and open source technology. And um, I also do it online. And so if I can provide a nice, warm, welcome space with a um, easy accessibility to getting beyond the movie speak of what our policies are. I mean, it's complex. It's not as simple as you just go make an edit, even though it is. There's always politics and there's rules and there's policy and programming. And how do we make it as easy as possible for more people to get involved and retain editors? That's been one of our biggest issues. Yeah. So his question was about uh, outreach, and you talked about methods. Yeah, but he also you know, asked about the tools. Yeah, break, so. breaking down barriers a little bit. So how do people, when, they, when you have these tools, when they go to Wikipedia, how do they know that they're there? How do they know that it's suddenly easier to we use? We won't, I don't know yet. Yeah. It's like I said, I'm sorry to be like, I don't know, but yeah. we, we're no, like, I understand. I'm just wondering, like, through this process, are you thinking about that? No, oh, one of the things are that you I do. About the outreach aspect of uh, right. we're all like scared. Right. One of the things absolutely. that I did to get the Hall County Public Schools on board is um, I took 
uh, I took it to the road. I went, you know, four hours, um, four hours, 40 minutes out um, to, to, the, to talk to the teachers. And, and so one of the administrators heard it and got excited and then was able in a week to pull the school superintendent in with yeah. some other larger, broader folks at the table. And I did the exact same talk and um, broke it down for them. And, you know, it was funny, the school superintendent, he was, he was sitting there, he had a tie on or whatever, and then he got up at some point toward the end. I said, well, he's not really into it. And then he comes back with, like, a coffee mug and his business card in, and he was like, when's your coursework done? And, uh, <laughs> and so, but he, was, he, was, he, was, he didn't say much, but he said, what my concern is, that this little thing you're doing is great, but I want it scalable. Yeah. I want to, uh, my concern is this is great, but I want this in other you know schools and environments in our system, so that this has its impact. So that's what his concern is that it's scalable. So issues around cross-platform is going to be an issue because if this is great and it gets you know some funding or whatever, it's fine. But at his point, you know, I'm letting you do this, but I'm do doing this with the condition that if it's successful, um, that we, has, we can scale it up. And so and so what happens is when you're going, you go there. And you, you get them on the table, then you have to talk about, you know, where, you know, make sure all the different stakeholders who are involved yeah. um, have a stake and also make sure that the, the tool does what it's supposed to do. But if what happens when it's successful is the killer app for this, you know, and I'm sure, you know, like with History Pen and other um, applications that are already disseminated and already available, it's just something that's uh, always an issue with these technologies that are open, um, what happens when it's, it does work and it's ready to be packaged up. So the outreach part is really m the f me going there. Yeah, I mean, my, <laughs> my best, as what I've been doing for the past almost two years with Wikipedia is, it was, I, I've been focusing mainly on cultural outreach, so going to the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. and I go around and I talk about it, I talk about it, I talk about it. I don't get a lot of editors, but I get people who want to explore crowdsourcing opportunities and blah, 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 blah. And that's really awesome. Um, and it's, that's what it takes. It, go, it takes going out, preaching the gospel, online and offline, and finding other passionate people. You know, the internet's special. We've got all kinds of personalities. Some people are good at speaking publicly. Some people aren't. Some people are terrible at interacting with one another. Some people aren't. And for me, and I mean, it's... It, and, you know, just like the truth is saying, we're the evangelists. We just have to go out. When this virtual editor gets out, it's going to be in the press. You know, Wikipedia is a little right. different. I mean, we're, you know, we raised $2.5 million two days ago for our fundraiser. And you can donate if you'd like right now. <laughs> no, but, um, it's, uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No. But we all, we all can use money, but I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's um, sorry. That was okay. I, I just wanted to add a little. There's also something going on in, in virtual worlds in terms of, it's d it's really difficult for a first-time user to deal with the with the screen that they use yeah. with on the client browser, and there's a big there's been a lot of movement towards getting a web-based browser for yeah. virtual worlds, and that is starting to catch on. Uh, it's not as um, you know as powerful, and you don't see as much uh, detail as you would on a, a regular browser, but it is a way for people to explore this without having to deal to ramp up, and I find that very encouraging. That as uh, also added being able to add that to a website as a doorway into, into a world, or as a doorway into your museum or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to, um, I, I, you know, by chance happened into a um, story, what's it called? Um, the virtual circle. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was excited, I was excited until I saw the price. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then, I mean, there's a cost to it, right? Oh, you mean for land? Mm -hmm. to, to, mm -hmm. to actually purchase? To actually, to, to actually start yes. building. There, if you wanted to actually be in Second Life property, yes, it's almost 300 a month for an individual yeah. to have an island, a private island. Mm -hmm. uh, however, that <laughs> there's now a great deal of land available in OpenSim. Uh, you can affiliate with the Franco grid, with the Kraft, the Italian grid. And there's a ton of grids out there. OpenSim. Them who are okay. for uh, renting land for as cheap as ten dollars a month. I mean, it okay. just depends on how much you want to share your server with. Oh. Uh, you know, so there's all price ranges now. Oh. Hypergridbusiness.com is a good place to look for that. Hi, Nancy, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just had a question. The first time I met Nutrius was at a IBM event up in Boston, mm -hmm. and I think you were the person who said one of the most kind of compelling things I've heard about second life and the virtual worlds in general, but mainly. Which is that 
the, the thing that's kind of weird about Second Life is here's this digital space that you know is on the internet, which has these unique properties and facilities that the real world doesn't have, and yet it recreates a lot of the obstacles and impediments <laughs> in the real world. And it's kind of like, why? And, and does that spell the ultimate doom, you know, or end the second life? Like, why no. Why do we create expensive real estate in the internet? <laughs> why do we create barriers to entry where, you know, the technology ostensibly is there to overcome those barriers? <laughs> uh, and those barriers are falling, first of all. Uh, um, when it started, I think that it, it probably was expensive to pay for all the servers and pay for all the administration time. And, uh, and I think they had, they had a business model that sort of promoted that. Uh, but I'm not going to speak to the internal you know, business workings of Second Life because I really don't know much about them. Uh, it's uh, why do people create, recreate what they have in real life? Why do they buy suburban homes and, and monster trucks and things like that and park them in front of their virtual? I don't know. Why did they, when I made a trophy for them uh, when they won uh, or when they finished the game on uh, Search for the Sci, I made a trophy that they got, which was a bell jar with that uh, sci finder tool in it. They took it home, they put it on their virtual mantelpiece, and they sent me pictures of themselves sitting in front of the virtual <laughs> mantelpiece with the trophy on it. Exactly the same thing you do if you want a bowling trophy. <laughs> People <laughs> like to live like they're in a real life, but a better real life. Uh, so one of the more successful augmented reality, mobile augmented reality projects in Georgia is for a home, home furnishing interior design company uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that does, so you have a marker in an empty space, you point your mobile device, it populates it with 3D furniture. And it's extremely popular in home front for this company because they've been able to get their investment back and then some. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, you know. I guess I'm just yeah. worried about that kind of thinking. And, and I don't want to, you know, discounted entirely, but one of the things that I'd like to see museums do more with the online space is find the ways in which we can do stuff there that we can't do in the Oh, yes. So it complimentary oh. rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Absolutely, but, you know, you, I think uh, virtual spaces are so new. I mean, uh, they're not new to me or to Latrice, but they're new to a lot of people. And the, the, the difficulty negotiating them is, a, is an issue. Giving them a familiar uh, surrounding in order to get oriented in is very helpful. I mean, you've got you've got to move them into that slowly. You know, I mean, it's, you, if you walked in, let's suppose you were from um, uh, Kansas and you'd never been in New York City, and somebody dropped you in the middle of Times Square, bell it's advertising with all its uh, uh, signage, with all the people, with all the noise. I, you know, and all of a sudden you're just so overwhelmed. You know, you, you're just not sure how to orient yourself. You need to you need to bring them, you know, a little slow, more slowly into that, and then start moving the walls away. Then start pushing the graphics into the space, mm -hmm. the, the the movies, the video into the space. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, it's funny because I one of the things very first things I did for uh, is take and stitch up photos of an um, a Second Life uh, created by Philip Mallory Jones. Of, 19, uh, of um, Chicago in the 50s, I believe. An amazing space, but I stitched it up and brought it into Argon for an augmented reality experience. So now it's from the vantage point of my avatar so that your mobile device, your iPad, or your phone can actually move around the second life space and you can embed place marks and things like that and click on it and as if it's your real space. So it's, um, you could do that with you know any kind of space in second life. Um, so building a fantasy space or building something that you de don't necessarily have as an extension of a show, for example, or an exhibit, and then having uh, um, being able to use some of the things like place marks uh, or things like that to take you. So you could be, or the opposite, you can be some other location and have you know the show, and people can experience that as a, a precursor or beginning to um, uh, an exhibition they're going to. There's lots of ways to do to kind of push and pull. You know, back and forth between the real and the and the, the virtual in order to create an experience that will bring people more into an in exhibit or into a show. Um, and these tools kind of allow you to do that if you have you can just pull them all together in your SDK and then you can um, create that experience. But I think one of the reasons why people um, want to recreate what they already know is because you know um, they. But for me, you know, I would like to not be, be a novice. I would like to know that I have some control, mm -hmm. that, I, that I'm going to learn. It's going to be incremental, but I'm coming from a point of view of a standpoint of knowing. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. So it's not all new, right. as you said. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's, what, that's, that's what yeah, you, you try to keep things in, in a relative scale to the yeah. avatar at first, mm -hmm. and then you can walk through into yeah. into something larger and larger sure. and larger. Yeah. Yeah. To, to Nancy's point and Anne's point, when I asked the question earlier about you know how could a, uh, I guess augmented reality in virtual spaces, can you could you recreate it? It was not about recreating a space because that's redundant. Mm -hmm. That's not the point of virtual reality. But I think there's a whole swath of um, people and potential audiences that we could engage in art or any other medium, you know, science or whatever, or natural history, by, by recreating spaces or creating spaces and, and, and dropping objects or, or, or garments, for example, that are in museums and, and, and see how they were used, you know, back three centuries ago, for example. The, the previous uh, uh, panel discussion, they were showing these magnificent robes that were on display in the Smithsonian, and I thought to myself, oh, how cool would it be to be able to wear that as an actor? You know, and I, how, how cool would it be to be able to, you know, and I, to be perfectly honest, I have many historical costumes, I mean, they, in my inventory, in my actor's inventory, because sometimes I just feel like being a pirate. You know, <laughs> I just want to wear it. You know? Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it gives you that opportunity. But one thing that you would, I, I thought of when you started that, that sentence was um, one of the most interesting challenges that I have coming up is uh, creating a space which allows people to actually study cyberspace mm -hmm. and actually study the internet from inside the internet and how do we do that and actually what physical or what 3D object actually represents the internet. I mean, we've all seen these uh, representations of what the internet looks like. It's a sort of big dandelion ball fuzzy thing. Uh, but maybe it doesn't really look like that. Maybe it looks like an ocean. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and how do you actually create this in a way, sort of like a 3D graphics meets conceptual mm -hmm. uh, theoretical physics kind of problem. And, uh, you know, and that's the challenge for the designers in the future, in my opinion, is how do you, uh, this is a new tool. This is not just a 3D tool. This is a new tool that is 3D, 2D, a graphic, video, all thrown in together. And how do you, how do you combine that into into something that makes cohesive and coherent sense? And I will say, I mean, one of the, the way I learned Second Life was when IBM, because IBM gave me a grant to do um, the last year, last, um, and I, that was how I learned how to build. I mean, I had unrestri no restrictions. Right. Um, to what I could do, and IBM was going to then promote it, you know, promote the show. So they had, you know, had these land grants in Second Life for, for artists. So I was able to go as big as I wanted to go, or as crazy as I wanted to go within, you know, the theme that I had decided to do. And um, I also had to learn scripting to make things mm -hmm. happen. So, you know, my current faculty advisor came to visit me as an avatar for my show and was particularly interested in, in one particular part of it that was also um, inspired by Louise Bourgeois work. So it had her, cage, her cages in, in there. In, in. So the, we were talking, it became a discussion about, well, you should script this to do this, and this should be done this, and you have these things opening up. So it, be, so it tested my scripting skills, and, but at the same time I gained scripting skills. You know, I gained, you know, out of doing that, it became part of the tool, you know, kit or tool box. So, to, so you kind of got to go in there. I mean, it's a flat space at the time you go in. There's nothing there. Um, and then you kind of have to imagine it's your canvas, so to speak. So that's another way, but it's, you know, I can also apply that into augmented reality. Um, it's a flat, you know, thing, and then how can you imagine what comes out of it, or what is the experience that you're going to have there? How, how does the user, just like what you do in a, a museum exhibition, how is the user going to, um, how do you control the flow of movement, or how, like you say, you stop people from flying? So they had to. So what limitations do you, you can't do that to people in physical space, because they can't fly, but you know, but, but you, what can you do to to maximize the experience, to create that experience, and that's really um, a part of the planning process. Not something I'm sure there's discoveries you'll make, but um, starting off with that flat thing, that canvas, or figuring out how to do that, I think is an exciting, an interesting activity for people to just do to really um, really get you going with these kind of technologies. Because then once you do that, it, you can start imagining other things that you may not have even imagined you could do. Uh, we, may, we may see a rough parallel to uh, the development of virtual worlds, virtual spaces, and, and their relationship to real world spaces and exhibits and, and all that other stuff. Uh, as
as we see in the movies where the uh, CG was uh, sort of like, we started with Tron more or less and, and everything was very rudimentary and then started to develop and more and more sophisticated. Every, every single movie had everything in it and it was all, it was really overload CG and then now they've sort of started to drop back and pull it back to where it's sort of becoming seamless and you can't really tell if that's somebody really jumping off the building or if it's a CG character. So it's so I think that we may see a real parallel going in this too, where they'll try everything first mm -hmm. and then they'll say, oh, no, it doesn't taste right. So mm -hmm. exactly next mm -hmm. keep going. I also think the skills that you bring from movies and television into storytelling yeah. um, are really, really important. I think Absolutely. that's something that we have not been uh, doing or using as much as we, we could or should or as well as we should in the museum world. Uh, you know, the flow, the pacing, the sound, the integration of all of the, of the storytelling. I mean, I mean, I was practically in tears just hearing your, you know, oh, okay. your story. Well, you know, right, came back. right, 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 right. And, it, uh, and, you're, and the way you laid that out is kind of how you would do for an alternate reality game. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly the premise, and then the story world you're going to create, and then telling the story, but also how people enter the story. How do people then? What do they do with the story after that? And what are the objects or artifacts or puzzles? that will keep people in the story. And that's all kind of very important part of the these kind of experiences using these um, environments is, 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 is that piece of it. Well, we had a group. I mean, a, as people came on the sim, they could join a group. And once they were in the group, then I could email them. Uh, I didn't do it all the time. But as we sort of started to close the sim, I started sending notices about things being spotted up in the sky and things starting to happen on the sim and mm -hmm. things, you know, and so more group people would come back and visit. So we get more and more visitation towards the end as they realize things were really changing. And then we had a big party at the end. All right, well, thank you so much. It's been such an honor.